Hell yeah. Welcome to the Right Mindset Podcast. I'm Thomas J. Beleza, your host with the most. I decided not to shave today because I'm growing the beard out. Don't judge the man, just the myth. Uh, today I have a, a special guest that I met on the tick of the talk. Hello, Cyril. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Hi, I'm Cyril M. DeMace. I'm a self-published author from North Dakota. Uh, got uh, two books out right now. The third book, The Last in My Fae Queen's Court series, is coming out May 12th. It's available for pre-order now. Uh, check it out if you're into contemporary fantasy or uh, humans who used to be fa- no, Fae who used to be humans. That's the right way around. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, did did they uh, did they drink something like the turtles where they got the ooze on them and they converted, or they they just started their life out that way? I have had several reviewers describe it as the X Men, but Fay instead. Okay. So it's something in their genetics, but there's also an outside force you don't really see until the third book. Okay. All right. All right. So it's like the X Fay. Yes, the X Fay. <laughs> the X Fay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in it to win it. I like that. Um, look, thanks. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I know that uh, we've interacted on the tick of the talk and uh, uh, we, we interact a little bit. And I was like, you know, I got to get you on the show. You got several books uh, and I, we're going to talk about those books today, too, uh, especially mm-hmm. the cover work. We'll get to that. I love your cover mm-hmm. work. So well, thank you. Um, but before we start any show, I always like to throw a question out there, maybe try to shake things up, get the get the noggin working. And uh, so my question to you is, <clears throat> when a person who's established in the industry gives you advice about your career as a writer, what is your least favorite advice or advice you feel is not actually advice, but just them doing the, this is what people have to say when asked? Huh. I honestly have to say people who give a one size fits all or uh, this worked for me. So everyone should do it. Uh, Even though like a lot of not just indie, but also trad publishing is just a matter of being in the right place at the right time, publishing the right ad, you know, people who think, Oh, this worked for me. So it'll work for everyone. That kind of advice I take with a pretty heavy grain of salt because it's just, it's not going to fit everyone and it's probably not going to work for most people but just because of how subjective the industry is yeah absolutely yeah it's it's that that idea that like oh you want to be a successful writer write every day but it's like Mm -hmm. it's not really advice (laughs) you know (laughs) it's just leave me alone or or like you said you know they go a little deeper they go you need to write a book about dragons because my book is about dragons and it's selling Mm-hmm. And, that, that, and it, or or my my least my least favorite version of what you're saying is the um, you got to write what sells. Yeah, right it's to market. Like, yeah, and and who's who's the judge what sells? I mean, there's a difference between because if you write quote unquote what sells, how do you present your voice? How do you create the stories that intrigue you? You know, Stephen King wouldn't exist mm-hmm. if his whole thing was. Uh, what's selling right now? Let me just focus on that. Yeah. Maybe, or an R.R. Martin or who was started as a sci-fi guy. And also he, yeah. worked, he wrote for television too, way in the back in the so, day. So popular, I think it is, which is the joke about why he can't finish the series. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's, as I always say, it's like, Oh, that five books, that four book series. <laughs> Allegedly it's supposed to end up six, but who knows? <laughs> Maybe he'll pull a Jordan and Brendan Sanderson will have to finish it. <laughs> For the uh, anyone listening, I think that's uh, you're talking about the uh, the, uh, the, wheel, wheel the wheels of time. of time. Yeah, the wheels of yep. time. Yep, you're upgrading um, that series. You know, speaking of uh, 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 um, Brandon Sanderson, with that, it are there any authors that you feel like if they, uh, God forbid, passed away, that you would be able to write? or finish their book in their voice? Like, do you have an author where you're like, oh, I just feel so connected to that style. I think I could do that. I think off the top of the head, one that I could really do the style just because it did inspire a lot of my non-Fake Queens court works is uh, Patricia C. Reed, I think it is. Uh, She wrote The Enchanted Forest Chronicles, which is kind of like fairy tales, but like played straight. So there's the tropes, like uh, he is the king of the Enchanted Forest, which is in almost the middle of his kingdom. 
but uh, not exactly because the land moves around. You have to be careful not to step on flowers because they could be lost princes. Uh, just sort of things like that. It's a very sort of like tongue in cheek style that I really enjoy. Uh, so, you know, if that sort of thing happened, I think I could pull it off because like I've got a series of shorts that I call the magical pest control universe. Okay. Uh, where every single magical creature, dragons, fire elementals, dryads, mermaids, all that are the results of magical experimentation by like wizards and sorcerers and witches. Uh, so it's, it also plays with tropes like very tongue in cheek. Like yeah. we're playing this straight but also kind of acknowledging the ludicrousy of what's happening here. Would you go as far to say it's a, uh, a, a more Americanized version of Monty Python? Honestly, it's, yeah, I think that's a pretty good description of uh, not just my series, but also Patricia C. Reed's work, uh, oh. at least the Channel Forest Chronicles. Oh, uh, excellent. So there's silly walks. There's a society of silly walks. Are, are... Almost <laughs> certainly somewhere. There's probably a religion based about it, around it in the Magical Pest Control universe. Uh, you know. <laughs> Well, you know, I, there was this one author who turned me into a newt, and I just would like you to know I got better. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it had to happen sometime. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're, you're working on, I would say, your third official novel is, is the novel that's coming mm -hmm. out. Uh, that, that is, that's the one series that you have written three novels for, or have you written novels before this that haven't been published? Uh my the first book I ever wrote was the first book in this series, Haven. It's actually my first completed project ever, short stories and whatever included. So I started backwards to most writers. <laughs> um, and before I started on another set of projects, I wanted to finish at least drafting the Fake Queen's Court series. Okay. So I finished Tedith, which is the third book. I think the first draft I finished about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been working on that. And once I finished drafting and edit, editing that, I actually started two other series, uh, which both have the first book finished. And okay. I'm hoping to publish one, hopefully in December, and then one sometime in 2024. And do you do you outline other books while you're writing books where you don't necessarily go into, you know, zero drafting or first draft, you just sort of like, I need, I'm going to lay these books out because they're in my head? Or do you dive right in and just write it? I like to be, when I'm drafting, I am focusing only on that project. Like I might do some edits on other projects or I do my short stories sometimes when I'm absolutely fried on drafting a project because I fast draft. So it's actually really, even I'm drafting four or 5,000 words a day of one of my main projects, that just fries your brain. Yeah. Uh, so the shorts are a break, but I do like to work on the one big project. Um, but when I'm between projects, I will or even while I'm doing it, I'll like start tossing ideas in a document, but the ideas will probably be as far as it goes until I'm done drafting and can move that other book to the, you know, the hidden side cabinet. So I don't look at it for a month. Yeah. Uh, that's how I started. That's actually when I did that with her, that's when I uh, started my sky pirates novella uh, okay. in that time period while I was waiting for that to marinate so I could come back and make it better. And, uh, so with with that said, since you're focusing on that, like you focused on this third book, is th is this, uh, am I hearing this right? This is the last book in the series or? this It is the last book in the original series. My original plan with this was to pull a Star Wars to have okay. a trilogy of trilogies, but I don't think that's the way I'm going to go now. I am still planning to, I want to write a prequel about um, the events that led to the creation of the Fae in the Fae Queen's court, uh, because they are an artificial species, uh, group of species, I should stay, say, uh, mm -hmm. that if you've seen any of my lore talks, uh, you'll know that they all go through three generations to go from mostly humanoid to say what you or I would consider a dragon. Okay. Um, so I wanna write the prequel about how that happened. And then I would like to write a sequel series set a few hundred years down the line about what happens after society has mostly accepted them. Oh, interesting. And the way it sounds is like the, you know, hundreds of years, or whatever in the future. Uh, it's not that they uh, repopulated the planet. It's that they mm -hmm. assimilated into the planet. Is that what you're saying? Yep. Assimilated they, in the current series, they're isolated in these places called havens, which are more or less reservations, you okay. know, um, the fail where they sell cigarettes. 
Oh yes, yes. And while we're, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> but they go. Uh, they they live there because a lot of human society is afraid of them because the change that turns them into fae is incredibly violent. People get hurt, and also it's you know scary to see your brother, your your wife, your daughter uh, turn into a humanoid dragon. That's kind of alarming. Yeah. Um, so they in in the in the setting of the first the, the original trilogy the main set uh it's you know they're kind of in a bit of a cold war with the humans where they're not technically allowed to leave their havens uh, but you know they got to go find new changed people they got to get supplies so yeah Okay. All right. And you know, speaking of your books, uh, let's let's throw up a. Uh, this is the first book. Is that correct? That's the third book. That is oh, wait, 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 wait. the last is, book. Is that's this the second? <laughs> wait, wait, wait! I got one more. I got one more. There we go. That's it. Right. Right. Haven. <laughs> Haven. Um, all right. So f- before we get uh, and uh, ignore the fact that it's uh, right in the middle of us, <laughs> but I want people to see the cover. Um, yeah. Did, who who designed the cover and who who uh, set it up for you? Well, I used when I was designing covers, I reached out to one of my writing groups and I said, "Who do you guys use for your covers?" And uh, this company called Ebook Launch was one of them. I think uh, their artist Dane was the one who did the Haven cover, uh, and they worked. We worked pretty closely together to take the idea I had. All of my covers are actually scenes from the books. So this actually does happen. Uh, and I said, uh, this is what I need. This is what the dragon looks like. The real big holdup is he had the hardest time conceptualizing that boat that strapped the dragon. Oh, yeah, I see it now. All right. That, that's that's it's a gondola in the book. They use that to transport people and goods because, you know, those spikes are really uncomfortable to sit on. <laughs> Give it time. Give it time. Yeah, you know? You'll get used to it. <laughs> you'll get used to it. Uh, no, it's an excellent, excellent cover. I love the color scheme. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, the, there's some, uh, you can see the different, uh, layers, you know, the heart, the horizon changes. I love that mm-hmm. uh, you got the forefront of the, I guess that's the protagonist. Is that the main yep, protagonist? That, that's Owen here. Yeah. All right. Nice. Nice. Now, uh, I guess you just call them dragons you said, or, or there's a different name for your dragons or. They are dragons. That in particular is what in world is called a third generation dragon. He's the third generation from being human. So as far as they're concerned, because it's only been 50 years since this started, so they don't have too many fourth generations to compare them against. Uh, but this is the quote unquote final form of the dragons. So they are, they're small. Uh, okay. they're, they're dragon dragons. And uh, do they talk or is it uh, like Aragon where they, uh, they mind talk to you? They are able of talking. However, my favorite little lore fact that never made it in is these dragons, because they fly and breathe fire through these hydrogen sacs in their bodies, which okay. make them lighter and you know also they light up. But uh, it makes their voices sound way higher pitched than you would expect. Oh, like a Mario? Like, hey, way. it's a me, a Mario. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. It's a lot higher than you would expect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that's funny. That's silly. I love it. It didn't end up like getting into the lore beyond the comp, like in the book itself, beyond comments that the voices weren't as deep as you would expect from beings the size of houses. Of course. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's still the, fun. It makes me laugh. Look, I, I, I have a friend, he's six, three and he, he has something with his throat. So he talks like this. But the first time I met him, I was like, this guy's huge. And then he's like, <laughs> Hey, I was like, and I was like, are you making that voice? And he's like, no, huh? I have a I have a throat thing, and I was like, "Oh, all right, that's cool." So it's always interesting because, like, our perception, like you said, Mm -hmm. it's a big dragon, but then they have, um, but that never made it in. So they have, like, I guess, quote unquote, normal voices, like to the to their uh, appearance. In my head, still a little higher pitched, but yeah, more normal. You you wouldn't like look twice if a if uh, like a six three guy had that voice. Yeah, (laughs) Uh, but you know, it does depend on dragon to dragon. Okay. Okay. Um, and then you're, you're the second book is, Oh wait, that's the first one. The second one is, uh, this one, Avalon. Is that correct? Yep. That is Avalon. Uh, and this one, we actually did have to go a bit more back and forth. It's actually the same dragon from the first cover. Uh, mm-hmm. and obviously he's having a much worse day. Um, yeah, yeah. This is, this is what happens if you go out partying and you get home at three, you, you have to take a nap while you're, uh, the protagonist, 
uh, waits for you to wake up. <laughs> yep, that's yeah, that's what's happening. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. They went to I see uh, Nickelback, and uh, yes. you know, <laughs> Nickelback. <laughs> it's a great show. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh. Uh, same artist, same cover. Oh, actually, it looks slightly different, but same artist. Is that? Uh... Yeah, I think this one was Alicia with ebook launch. Um, we had. She, she already had the dragon to reference, so that one was pretty easy, but we had to scale Owen down a bit because he's supposed to be able to stand straight in the gondola underneath the dragon. Oh. And um, yeah, obviously I wanted this cover to show the much darker tone the series takes after the first book. You know, Haven has a more whimsical cover. It's, you know, he's looking at a dragon, sense of exploration. This, something has clearly changed, which really helps delve into you know the the changes that happen to not just owen but sort of the tone of the story after the end of the first book yeah and also this being the second of a trilogy usually that's the conflict that's the yeah. that's the darker uh book and um now avalon uh is that a character name or a location it is a location all three of my books have at least thus far in the fake queen's court series they're all pseudo locations like a haven is obviously the haven where everyone lives but also ties into you know the main character finding a haven for his family avalon is well it's like the avalon of legend it's where king arthur lit is waiting to return it's like sort of like almost a heaven destination uh in this case avalon is sort of representing like a salvation almost but also something has to go seriously wrong to get there, yeah. uh, which I won't say, you know, too much, but yeah, don't give it away. pretty dang serious that uh, before they get to Avalon, he gets a, he gets a heroin addict uh, addiction. Is that what you're saying? It's not too, uh, I won't say it's drugs, <laughs> but uh, he has, to, he has to consume something on the regular when he gets to, after he gets to Avalon. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. So let's jump to the third book, since that's the the big one that uh, you have uh, getting ready to come out. What do we get? What do we got here? Are you okay? I, my little dog, who's a huge dog. What's going on, buddy? Lejat. Good boy. <laughs> I had a I had a collie lab cross who always used to try to uh, you know come see who was talking whenever I was on uh, a, a video call. <laughs> I know he's like, hey, what's uh. I got to speak to him in Russian, though, or he doesn't listen to me. <laughs> Some dogs just have opinions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, this clearly looks like a third artist. This is a new artist. Is that correct? Yes. I forget. Top of head. I want to say it was Alice Alicia again. Uh, but we tried to keep the same vibe. Again, it's an ebook launch cover for separate reasons. I don't know if I'm going to use them again. But... You know, at this point, I have enough experience in the industry. I can find more cover artists. I don't need to just rely on the same company keeping the same vague style. Of course, of course. Uh, and how do you pronounce this style? Is it high Hirith? Uh, Hirith. Uh, it is oh, a Welsh right. word that specifically it is used to refer to Wales, but it means sort of a nostalgia for a home that doesn't exist and maybe never did. Okay. Okay. I like that. It doesn't exist anymore. It's one of my favorite words. I was really, really happy. It really fits the, the, the tone and themes of the book of uh, Owen trying to end the war that's going on among the Fae, uh, the a morally gray side character who is, you know, trying to do his own thing to help the Fae and his people. Uh, and then also it does see Owen going back home. Owen is Welsh, my main character. Uh, okay. He gets to go back uh, to Welsh, to Wales for a bit in this book. Uh, so your story, your fantasy stories take place on, uh, earth. Correct. Uh, technically earth approximately 2075. Uh, so it's 50 years post our time. Okay. Okay. Now, are you worried that it's going to turn into a star Wars thing or like a back to the future thing? Like where we catch up to the time and we realize we're a little, we're, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, wise it's actually the fae themselves are somewhere in between um us and a 15th century peasant okay they okay. have to produce a lot of their materials and food and clothes on their own so they wear homespun homespun stuff but you also have people walking around in like a dc shoes 
um, okay. Okay. and have cell phones just because it's what did we manage to bring with us when we left our homes and came to the Haven where trade isn't allowed. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they're going to get there eventually, but I am a believer in uh, humanity is in its uh, Infant- middle ages period uh, right now, like in terms oh, of okay. scientific development, we haven't had a shot forward technology wise, like we saw with the invention of the car or the invention of the internet uh, in a while. So I actually don't think like besides fashion is changing, uh, the science technology is going to change too much between now and 2075. Uh, but I might be wrong. Maybe they'll invent teleportation tomorrow, and that just throws 90% of my concept out of the water. Uh, uh, you know? <laughs> I got two questions. One is, uh, uh, what's a car? Is, is that like... Uh, no. <laughs> uh, no, my, my real question, though, is uh, I guess Owen is the protagonist, right, as you're saying? That's correct. And yeah. he is... he is a, And you don't have to give anything away, but for, all, for argument's sake, he's a human, like a normal human? For most of the book. Okay. Okay. And he's sort of like our walk into that world. And he- yeah, he is. He starts the book uh, as a human. He and his family live in Kansas, actually, which ties into a Wizard of Oz joke that I have running through the whole series. Um, uh, but he is actually what is called what they call Feyborn, which okay. is humans who have the potential to become Fey. Oh, all right. So right. that's like my uncle. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this is interesting. So you got the three books. It sounds like you have a lot of lore that you put into it and a lot of effort. So that leads me to uh, a question I like to ask people with their trilogies and things. Has the lore expanded because of the books or have you developed the lore and then just kind of uh, uh, honed it by writing the books? I'll take more of the second. I wrote the first three chapters back when I was in college um, and then got three chapters in and realized, wait a minute, maybe I should actually develop this more than the vague ideas. Pardon me. I was throwing around then. Uh, So I stopped, I developed the original 12 species, the three generations that each of them have. um, And then the basic world state a bit later on, I developed the 13 subsidiary species to the original 12. Okay. Um, so those did come later, but mostly I had the lore and then I just sort of refined it by what I needed for the books versus, um, or sometimes I had to really change things in the books because I'd already published Haven by that point and uh, yeah. I was kind of stuck in stone. <laughs> well, you can go back. They did that with Frankenstein and The Hobbit. One Lord mm-hmm. of the Rings came out. R. Uh, R. R. Tolkien. Yeah, no, R. R. Tolkien. Tolkien went back and he actually rewrote sections of the book mm-hmm. to fit the darker tones of Lord of the Rings, and that yeah. happened, uh, I believe, twenty years later. And uh, Frankenstein was rewritten by uh, by Mary Shelley herself to mm-hmm. add new themes and ideas to the book. So it's not uncommon for a second edition or a third or fourth edition to alter or adjust things as needed. Yeah. Just... Ah, I'm planning one when I think in a year or two I want to I've got like an appendix appendix that sh- oh. that I put in the second book and the third book and I've made some small changes so I do want to one day put out second editions with the fully expanded appendix I've got character species art of all of my species I'd love to include in the ebook version at least yeah uh, but. Now that's that's a next year plan. Although, or maybe I'll just push it when I do my omnibus in six months. I want to release the whole trilogy as one book. Already got the cover. That's the way you got it. It's just boom, here it is, next book, right? Yep. Um, now it sounds like uh, do you mostly like to focus on releasing books as eBooks and not necessarily get, having a physical copy? I like doing both, but thing like with the omnibus is that would be a 600 page book closer to 700 i actually think so that would be a very big book be very expensive to print um and also i don't know how well the art would translate if i can couldn't get it in the book in cover so that's like i've got to do more research before i can do that i'd love to have the omnibus in a physical copy but uh, that might just be a this is for me and uh (laughs) Other people, they get the ebook for the omnibus. Yeah, and have you seen a good return on the ebooks? Like it, like it worked where people would 
because I, I know like a lot, there's the Kindle and the, and the other uh, devices. And it seems like people are always on, like on a subway or even on a, on a plane. It's very rare that I see someone holding a physical book unless, you know, I'm home and I'm reading it. <laughs> yeah. I definitely sell more eBooks than I do physical copies. Um, I'm very lucky in that I've got a local bookstore um, in my hometown uh, where a lot of my friends and family still live and they want to support me and the local bookstore. So I know a bunch of probably got 50 or so copies from just that wandering around my hometown. Um, but most, mostly the eBooks are the better return for me. Um, okay. especially since I got off Ingram, but that's it. Well, yeah, I, I hear there's uh, <laughs> things going on with Ingram and also like following the statistics that they give you it takes a while right they don't they don't hand over the statistics quickly anymore ebooks are 30 days off um yeah. for reporting any sales you can't control if you want to stop distributing them they can just offer a 25 percent discount it's yeah it makes i don't offer ebooks on ingram anymore you know amazon yeah. is amazon uh but they're still a much better option because they control so much of the market. But looks like Smashwords and uh, D2D are making inroads into the ebook industry, which, fingers crossed, will make a real competitor for uh, KDP one day. Listen, any opportunity for people who want to self-publish uh, to really get their business going, I think, is worth it. You know. Yeah. Um, now. Did you think when you first started writing, you were like, I, I want to self-publish. I'm not really interested in traditional publish and the ebook is the way to go. Was that something that was a conscious decision? Not originally. Originally, I really had my heart set on traditional publishing. I didn't like actually decide to self-publish until I hired an editor uh, to look at Haven and I was talking to her, it's like, oh yeah, I also, I forgot the sequel. I'm starting work on the third one. I was outlining at this point for the third one. Uh, and she said, you know that like Haven really isn't a good traditional publishing book. It's a bit, it doesn't fit nicely into their call, into the their, their categories. Uh, and also they're really not going to want you to have all the sequels fully written. Uh, so you should really look at indie, indie or self-publishing. And I was like, ah, no, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. But I hadn't had any luck with agents or pitching contests. Yeah. Uh, so I just like decided to like start looking into it one day, asked all of my uh, friends in my discords. And uh, I was like, I think indie is indie self-publishing is that's the route for me. Uh, and it will give me a lot more control over the process because, you know, Control freak here. I don't want to give uh, my cover design or uh, what my lore looks like, blah, 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 control to someone else who decides what's marketable. Uh, so that works. And it opened up a lot more like contests, like uh, the book bloggers novel of the year or self-published fantasy blog off that I don't think you can enter either of those if you're trying to publish. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So that that's good, though, that that you did your research and you uh, you tracked down what was working, what was not working. You weighed things out. And I think that's important, especially for those who are listening, who are really on the fence, like where do they want to go? Should they even try? There, there's nothing devaluing about self-publishing. It's a business mm -hmm. as in its own right. It's a different business than traditional publishing, but yeah. there it's still a business. And, you know, <clears throat> have you found that over the years of publishing your books uh, that it's become easier to figure out what works for you marketing wise and how to really get the message out there for your books? I would say yes. Like as I learn more, I learn, okay, don't waste time with this type of ad. It doesn't work. Um, this is where the series really shines. So start focusing on that. You know, as you get more reviews, you start learning more about this is like the niche that really seems to enjoy the book. So I've definitely learned more, like as the whole process went on of like how to market, how to present it. Um, so that's been very useful. And of course, you get more friends in the industry, people who can help you give you advice if you have questions about a specific uh, part of the industry that maybe you want to start looking into like ebooks, no, not ebooks, audiobooks, mm -hmm. um, or a new site. Uh, new contests, things like that. Uh, 
I didn't see it. Do you have an audiobook version? Have you thought about it? Is it something you're working on? I would love to have an audiobook version. Um, it's not in the cards for me right now, price wise. Um, my brother in law has, who really wants to like get into audiobook narrating, has offered to do it. Uh, but of course, I don't want to do it for free. If someone is, you know, doing me a service like that, I'm going to compensate them fairly, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, according to the SAG unit, it's $125 per recorded hour. So just kidding. Yep. <laughs> It's, and, and you know that because yeah. I, I I was in I'm in the entertainment industry, but uh, mm-hmm. um, which by the way that means like if I did five hours of work, but they only use two hours of the recording, I only get paid for the two hours. I don't get paid for the five hours. So it's it's always an interesting like how they work it out. They're like you'll get this much, yeah. but it's only what they use. <laughs> you know, like, Theor- so, uh, theoretically, you'll get this much. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What what has been really the uh, the process for you that you've enjoyed the most when working on this trilogy? I really enjoyed the world building. World building is my favorite part. Um, actually, I think the logistics of the world building is my favorite part. I really started developing this series because I got struck with the idea of what would it take to turn a human into a dragon? Um, and then obviously it ballooned from there. I'm kind of known in some of my beta reading critique groups uh, as the person you go to if you've got like a a sticky lore problem or something that you need to like, how do I explain this? Mm -hmm. That's my favorite part. Uh, World building, I think in general, is my favorite part of the the writing process at least. And then interacting with uh, critique uh, advanced readers, beta readers, getting to see other people's reactions and like fine tuning it to mm-hmm. the the emotion that I want from them at that point. Now, uh, going into your writing process a little bit, where, where you just you know you uh, you like the world building. What is your technique for world building? Because there are there are different techniques to really build the world out. Um, what is your go to? What do you really enjoy? Um, what is your method of world building? Is the question? I typically well. Fake Queen's Court series, I obviously did things different because it was my first big foray into that sort of project. I started with the world, the main character came later. But uh, with my current projects, I start with the concept for the world, uh, and then I find the main character, and then I find their niche in the world. Um, and once I have, what is this character? What do I need them to do to make the tell the most interesting story in this world? Uh, I'll develop uh, the... Magic system, usually, if I'm going to have a magic system somehow. Yeah, in a fantasy? Um, <laughs> I know, shocking. Um, I developed the magic system, and then I'll develop, like, how has that impacted the world? What's the political situation? Uh, what kind of environment are they in? Is it winter? Is it uh, mountain? Is it desert? Uh, what kind of animals do they have? Uh, what's the technology level? Like, Fake Queen's Court is obviously contemporary fantasy, but Sky Pirates is a gas lamp fantasy. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then Fallen Night, which is my other series, is your classic epic high fantasy. And each of those required different levels of, like, intense world building. Uh, And not necessarily in ways you'd expect. Um, I think the, for Fake Queen's Court, obviously, the most work got put into the species, which I said I developed in some cases uh, before I developed my main character. Uh, I did a lot of edits of those first few chapters. Uh, my second series, though, it was mostly what's the difference between alchemy and magic? Yeah. Uh, Clearly bananas. Uh, <laughs> uh, to go a little deeper into that process, how? what is your process of representing that world building in your stories to mm. dis- to expose it to the reader? Meaning, uh, as an example, you know, are are you more of an exposition kind of uh, world builder? Are you an interactive world builder? Are you a you know narrative pontificator of world building? Like, what is your your uh, your method of madness? I like I like having a stranger to the world. Like Owen is obviously he's a human coming into the phase world. Uh, mm-hmm. This learning their culture. In many cases, their species, how they've changed since they left human society. Uh, my second book, the protagonist, is, my second series, I should say, the protagonist is a farm boy essentially joining a flying pirate ship. 
Um, Plus. I like the outsider coming in because that really gives me the opportunity to come in on bits of lore or information that might not necessarily come out with a more established character. Hmm. Um, but when I'm not doing that, I prefer like a narrative summary or like a reason for the main character to be thinking spe- or talking about specifically that. Uh, I don't like just like, oh, this is a teleporter. It works, blah, 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 in prose, because that just it feels a little clunky to me. Yeah, uh, not yeah. that I've ever used a teleporter uh, <laughs> in my books. <laughs> Uh, well, you said you had these. Uh, what are they called? Cars? Or that's like <laughs> yeah, it's a car, car, car. Yeah, like car. It tele- yeah. teleports you from one place to the other. Yeah, when you yeah. fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Teslas, right? They just yeah, <laughs> you fall you asleep. Did. That's a good one. You did good. You did good. That was good. I like that. Um, all right, so that's interesting. Yeah, so it's it's as if the reader gets to explore the world for the first time through the protagonist exploring yeah. the world for the first time. And allowing yeah. uh, uh, situations, specific situations, to kind of dictate uh, the knowledge uh, relayed. So that that's interesting. Yeah, um, is that something you made a conscious decision on, or is that just where your writing style kind of found itself through the process? Or you were just like reading books and you're like, I cannot stand how they're going off on this stuff. I will never do that. Well, I. I'd say it was just sort of, it's mostly where my writing style led me, but it is definitely influenced by the types of books that I read growing up. Uh, big Tolkien fan, big C.S. Lewis, Patricia C. Reed, as I said, uh, Robert Jordan, and the thousands upon thousands of authors I read when my parents didn't supervise my reading. Um, is that why you say, uh, what is it called in your uh, bio, uh, the, inapp- the age inappropriate stories? <laughs> Yep, I that is not an exaggeration. I read the Silmarillion at five years old. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, Dad, I didn't understand it all, but uh, I loved it, and I've read it three more times since. Um, but yeah, it's I look at those sorts of things, and it's like I enjoy that, but I maybe want I want it to wanted it to flow a bit more nicely with the story to be enthralling in its own way, but not so much. You need to be constantly flipping back to the appendix to figure mm. out who so-and-so is and what that thing is. Yeah. Why do we got to follow uh, where, where our nose takes us? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you got to be a fan of Gandalf if you like the fan, the, right? He's the, he's, the, he, he's the walker. He's the one that like yep. brings you through the world, right? Helps explain uh, everything. <laughs> I love myself a little halfling. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, all right. So when you use your social media, is it a conscious decision to uh, let it be mostly um, a, a, for, a, a, a platform for your book selling? Or do you like to create some sort of conversation or, or communication with your audience that's a little bit beyond just your books sorry um oh, that's with like twitter i really i want the bigger like conversation aspect who knows how much longer that will last <laughs> uh considering twitter's problems yeah. but um with sites like tiktok with instagram it's, you know, it's mostly there for marketing the book. I'm, you know, I'm trying to like build up on the community, find people I regularly interact with, with uh, interesting questions or people who are like, this is what I do. What do you do? Uh, so, you know, you can get your, this is your own particular method out in the world and find some really fun ways you hadn't considered uh, to approach a problem that might work better for you than what you're doing. And what, what is one problem that you have discovered um in yourself as a writer because somebody said something that made you think uh, about a different way to approach it. So my question is ultimately, what is one problem you have that you discovered because somebody looked at it differently and you've, you've adjusted? Um, in my early books, I really struggled with uh, like character, like mo- motivation is not the word uh, agency character agency and like everyone was like oh we love the book but you know it's just missing something missing something and i was like trying to like struggling to figure it out because everyone commented how much they love the lore they love the ending uh and then it wasn't until my dad read it and uh 
was like giving me a basic commentary. And we sat down one night to watch Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the scene where Sean Connery scares all the seagulls up into destroying the uh, the, the plane. Yep. He stops the movie, looks at me, and says, Aaron, do you know what your book needs? That. You need to have Owen doing something like that. Uh, <laughs> that actually did end up dramatically changing the first half of the book. Um, but it, just, it, it, it showed me more, like, I, I had problems with giving pe- characters motivations, with making things... Oh, yeah like interesting uh, beyond just the vague, Owen wants to protect his kids, which that's any parent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what is but how they his, protect the kids yeah, is the how story. Is, how is he protecting his kids? Uh, why are they even running if there's not going to be any like big drama for him to have to protect them from? Um, yeah. and, and then uh, also blurb writing. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah, I, that's an that's actually a really good scene in the in the crusade too when he's One doing. One of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, because he's like you got because he says you got to use the the trees. Uh, he he recites the Bible or so he's like use the trees, <laughs> the lands, the mountains, and he just walks away. Do 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 do. That's such a great movie, great moment too. Um, so that moment helped you discover different ways to present the action. Mm-hmm. of their motivation and not just allowing their motivation to be something that drives them. Yeah. And, and lets the readers really see, like it's, it's showing versus telling. I can yeah. tell them no one will do anything to protect his kids. Uh, but if he's willing to w- knock out a police officer uh, while they're wanted, while he's technically a wanted criminal, yeah. uh, that's, <laughs> that's another boat entirely. <laughs> Or, you know, like the whole book, he's like, I want to protect my kids. And everyone's like, he wants to protect his kids. And then the moment comes and he's like, forget that. That's too dangerous. And he runs the other way. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I'm telling you, he wants to protect his kids, just not get eaten. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, have you recently uh, read a book, uh, independent or or traditionally published, where the character was, quote unquote, defined and then, like, they just started doing stuff that was so out of character. It was almost like you were reading a different character. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say I read a lot of Jane Austen, like, fan fiction, Jeff, the published kinds, because I do oh. love those. They're really good for, like, clearing my mind when I have too much indie stuff. Um, and that's actually, I'm saying that because it's the most recent book I've read. Uh- <laughs> It's just, I look at a character and if they've got someone in practice, like this particular one was like Mr. Collins and they turned him into a predatory priest. And I was just sort of like, that's everything against what he's saying on the page in that particular book. Yeah. Um, see, beyond that, I'm struggling to remember other books I've read because I, I have read them. I'm just, choo. <laughs> yeah, uh, the Jaff is the only thing that's coming to mind. <laughs> Well, what what do you feel, in your personal opinion, is the solution to ensuring that doesn't happen to a character in a story while writing? Honestly, get get beta readers, get people to look at the book and be like, okay, you, your character is constantly saying you're saying your character wants to do this particular thing, but he never does, or um, she says she wants to do this, but she's always doing that instead. Uh, and trying to say that it's this when it's not, yeah. uh, like, cause sometimes as authors, we're just too close to the final product to really see what we're doing and how it comes off. Um, like that's obviously not going to fly. So having, a have the other pair, other perspectives on your work helps you minimize the character inconsistency. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, we have that biased uh, appreciation and love for the stories and we know the characters. So in our mind, we're like, well, of course they would do that. But like if people aren't seeing their whys and understanding their whys, it's good to have that. Now, you said beta readers and and something, especially for the audience listening, like there are there are alpha readers and beta readers. Alpha readers would be more of a structural and, uh, you know, more of the technical side of the read. And then once the book is kind of cleaned up based on those notes, you give it to beta readers and it's their experience to the read and their connection to the story and characters. How often have you used alpha readers to an advantage 
in your process? Um, alpha readers are actually a relatively new part of the process for me. Mm -hmm. um, with Haven, I used one or two, but it was mostly beta readers way before I was actually ready for beta readers. Um, but with like my current books, I'm using them to be like, okay, does my lore, which is so crystal clear in my head, make sense to you who does not know all the side things that I know, all the blanks that I can fill, yeah. uh, which is, I think the most useful part, because they also can point out the massive structural flaws, uh, in the world building that just don't make sense without something <laughs> I know in my head or something I might have completely missed. You know, and it's, it's important too, because like one of the big things, uh, you know, I, I'm a developmental editor, editor <clears throat> and one of the things I get a lot from clients is they have lots of scenes because every scene does one thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, like I needed this scene. Why? Well, because I needed this person to know this thing. All right. But what else is it doing and what are we learning and you know, where's the agency and urgency and motivations and the blah, blah, blah. Um, is that something you feel you have struggled with in the past and that you've learned to correct or course correct where you were making a scene for one element <laughs> without really getting the most out of it? Oh, a hundred percent. Haven, I cut, I think 17,000 words from Haven. Um, okay. that was just scenes that didn't like every single thing was narrated. This is how he got to point A to point B. This is why he knows factoid F. <laughs> um, so, so much. I got a lot better with Avalon. Actually, I'll say I got a lot better once I started plotting. I, I discovery wrote most of Haven and that is not how I write these days at all. Yeah. No, no shame to discovery writers. It's a Plus. great method of writing. It just doesn't work for me to produce a nice draft. But once I learned how to like how to plot out my books in a way that worked for me, I could make scenes that were advancing the, the main plot, the individual character arts, maybe a subplot or two. Like I learned how to make the scene, make what I needed work in a single scene mm -hmm. uh, a lot better than when I was in my early days as a writer. Now you bring up out outlining, and uh, you know I, I definitely uh, I'm a I'm a uh, passionate architect, as one might say. Um, for the audience, you know, because th this show and and the Right Mindset channel mm -hmm. is all about people learning different ways to do it and that they're also not alone, that some people, they do it the ways they do. But, it, you know, not everyone has to do it. I, like you said in the beginning, actually, where it's like sometimes you get general advice mm -hmm. where it's not good for you. But but it's nice to hear what works for you. And with that said, what is your outlining process? And I'll give a caveat to that as in an example. For me, I like to work through the 27 point outline, the seven, the 27 plot point outline based off a three act structure. And I work through those beats, creating chapters to represent that. So as an example, so if you could explain your process like that. Sorry, it's allergy season. I'm pulling back a sneeze. Yeah. Uh, sneeze away. <laughs> no, it's faded. Um, what I do is, and I, I started doing this with Avalon and I've continued all my books since, is I start with a usually about a half page summary of what I want the book to be. This is where he starts, this is the midpoint and this is the end. And then I break that down into chapters, um, usually with about a paragraph description of this is what I need to happen in the chapter. Um, to advance the story in the way I want. Uh, this is when I need to introduce this character. This is when they need to be at this location. Um, but I don't hold myself to that. Uh, like maybe they take too long doing this in this chapter. Uh, so this character can't come in until the next chapter, which means I have to adapt this. So my outlines are very much, they're like living documents. They'll change mm -hmm. almost as much as the book itself uh, over the course of writing as I figure out what I need for this book or maybe what I had originally planned just doesn't work at all. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay. So, and then usually when I'm in like the last five or six chapters as I'm getting into the third act, 
uh, I will actually take the outline that I have and expand it, just work really more into details so I can make sure I'm hitting each point when I need to hit it uh, and that I'm not missing anything. So a plot line ends up completely abandoned. Yeah. Um, and uh, what's a plot line? No. Uh, so <laughs> uh, to go a little deeper into that process, <clears throat> do you find yourself taking each act like act one, two and three? And kind of divvying it up into its own complete story. Like Act One has a beginning, a middle, and end, a clear, a clear introduction, a clear conflict, and a clear resolution before it goes into like the next phases. Not typically. I typically do like building action and like falling to the climax. Okay. Cool. Um, I think as a, with each book, I like to joke that I it's a different process. Mm -hmm. um because i mostly do what i said with the the big outline the middle baby outlines uh that i change but like i recently read um save the cat okay yeah <laughs> which yes was really like influence and i did that uh when i was drafting the first book after i finished Harif, um sky pirates uh mm -hmm. which i think just sort of like passively influenced me um, to like, okay, this is a thing that I need to be aware of by this point. I should maybe, you know, have, I should have the theme stated a few times, uh, by the halfway point, they need the false victory or the, the defeat, uh, to really get things in motion. But I don't like hold myself like as tightly to the three act structure. It's just sort of really nice when I go back later in the editing process and I can be like, okay, this is more a thing that should have been introduced in act one. This is something that it's really fun here, but it would be better for the story if it were at the end of Act Two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, each act has a purpose. You know, for anyone listening out there, Act One is usually defined as the setup, introducing the characters, the theme, the promise, uh, and also setting up what they their potential is. And mm -hmm. then the rising, uh, the ascending rise to the midpoint conflict is a challenge to what their potential is to see them capable. And then, of course, the midpoint, as uh, as you were pointing out, is where the lie is exposed with truth. And now what the protagonist believed was was true is, is disproven and puts them into a situation where they have reached their limits of potential and couldn't overcome. And then they have to find a solution for the descending uh, uh, fall from the midpoint conflict where they have to find a solution to overcome what has changed for them in the midpoint. And of course the resolution is, is the third, the third act where, uh, they indeed use the solution found to overcome, uh, the main conflict, uh, in the midpoint. Um, is that something that is a conscious reality for you? Well, outlining or, do you outline general ideas first before putting any um, any rules on, on the positions? I outline the general ideas first so I know the bones of the story. Mm -hmm. um, and then I go more into uh, how does this fit like in the scope of the story? What do I need to do to get to this point? Yeah. Yeah, because I was – I. I you know, I've worked with a client a couple of times where uh, they they have a lot of stuff they want to put in the beginning where they're just like, this is this is I want this here. And you have to explain to me, you go, well, the rule of this section wouldn't necessarily challenge your protagonist yet, because mm -hmm. then that activates the inciting incident to change, which then jumps you to a new which is fine if that's the story you're trying to tell. But you can't have the inciting incident and then go backwards in the story to maintain normalcy in the ordinary world. Yeah. Like, you know, mm -hmm. there are certain activators, you know, yeah. uh, you know, like the, there's the, the inciting incident is the first plot twist or, or, uh, um, or like dun, dun, dun moment. Yeah. Yeah. The point of no return. If you're using the, the, the save the cat and you know, the midpoint, there are certain beats that have to reach, uh, mm -hmm. certain areas, but it, you know, again, the rules are there to be broken. Um, but storytelling mm -hmm. in a, in a sense has almost been mastered over the mm -hmm. years to be like a good story needs an intro. 
it needs some tension and conflict, but it also needs a resolve or we cannot connect to these characters on their <laughs> journeys of how they get through what they do. Right. Yeah. All right. So we've reached the uh, end of the episode. So I'm going to ask uh, the question that I end every show with. What is one piece of advice you discovered about writing either through someone else or yourself that completely changed the way you approach the writing process? Uh, read your work out loud. Listen to it out loud. I cannot stress that enough. How much my my line work skyrocketed when I started doing that. I use a site called Natural Reader uh, mm -hmm. because most of the time, oddly, when I'm in an editing stage, it's peak allergy season and I have a cough fit to, you know, hack a lung out. Um, <laughs> but listening to it out loud, it helps you find the odd phrases. It's really good for finding inconsistencies. Uh, it makes my dialogue sound so much more natural because it's, it sound like I have to listen to it and be like, okay, nobody talks like that. Or um, uh, this discovery just doesn't work. It hangs around in my head better as I'm writing. And it just, oh, it makes it so much better. Listen to your work out loud. Uh, Word has a feature to do that. Google has a feature to read it to you. And then you can do your line edits, like at least one draft of line edits like that. 10 out of 10, highly recommend. Uh, is it more fun when the voice is a robot voice or a human voice? <laughs> I use the voices I use are like I think we would call them like a AI. They're oh, like they're like, synthesized. They're not AI. They're synthesized and they sound pretty natural. Like there's yeah. still like the emotion is wrong. Um, but that's easier on my ear and makes me like able to actually listen if it sounds if it's a middle ground between uh C3PO and uh, a, a person. Yeah. Uh, but do you remember like the GPSs and AOL where like it had the voices? I wish like I could get Conan, uh, Conan O'Brien to read my work, you know, <laughs> as a computer. <laughs> yeah, no, that's yeah. probably a few years out from here. <laughs> it's coming one of these days. Celebrities are just going to sell their voice packets. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be awesome. Because I used to have them always go, you got mail. <laughs> All right. With yeah. that said. Uh, you know, thank you so very much for being on the show and uh, deciding to give me your time and to uh, humor my terrible uh, humor. <laughs> <laughs> I had worse. <laughs> um, but before you go, let me um, blow you up to the full screen. Why don't you tell the audience how they can find you and what's going on? All right. I am uh, pretty much everywhere as Cyril N. Domace, no spaces, uh, TikTok, uh, Twitter, uh, my website is sarahlandemace.com. I got a lot of art and lore about the Fake Queen's Court series on there. If you're looking at me for an Instagram, I'm not Cyril, because I think I'm funny. Uh, my Facebook account is Cyril and Demace Author. Um, and as always, I'm available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, Smashwords, uh, most places that books are sold if you want to look up the Fake Queen's Court series or any future work I point out, I put out. <laughs> Perfect. And all that information, well, your website uh, and, and bio will be in the description of the video. Mm -hmm. For anyone listening on audio that's intrigued, uh, Cyril is C-E-R-I-L. And then her the middle initials is just the letter N. And then the last name is D-O-M-A-C-E. So you can look that up. But again, just check the description. Go to the YouTube channel, support the channel, and uh, you'll see a quick link to uh find yourself buying her books and uh, and the new one's coming out soon you could do pre-order right now three dollars and 39 cents is it 99 cents what is three dollars and 99 cents and the first two will be on sale until may 12th when the third one comes out so if you want to get the first two for less than three dollars uh hit them up quick less than a month now nice i'm in i'm in <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me do my goodbyes with a final word. Boom. So uh, let me let me throw it out there, everybody. You know, I'm always I'm always grateful uh, to give these final thoughts when I have some amazing guests. And uh, you know, 
it seems like I'm a little biased because everyone I have on is a fantasy writer. But let, let's be honest. We live in a fantasy world in our heads. So why not explore it through these other stories? And one of the things that I really loved about today's episode is taking the real world experience and saying, what if? And uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty intrigued to read these books because I like the fey dragons and mystical creatures. And to think that we humans were influenced to become such a thing is uh, every boy's dream, every girl's dream. You know what I'm saying? So allow yourself to explore the fantasy world of your desire. Don't feel like you need to write for someone else. Write for you. And if it's weird, let it be beautifully weird and come from your truth. And as always, you know, you got to keep developing the right mindset. I'll see you next time. Thank you again. Love you all. Bye. Bye.